Matthew McCabe. Welcome to Miracle Voices. Each episode, we will be delving into stories of forgiveness, healing, and transformation that have come about from integrating the principles of the book, A Course in Miracles. If you want to learn more about A Course in Miracles, visit www.acim.org. If you'd like to visit the Miracle Voices site, please go to www.miraclevoices.org. If you feel inspired to make a love offering, please visit us at miraclevoices.org forward slash donate. All donations go to support the work of the Foundation for Inner Peace, the publisher of A Course in Miracles. Now here's your program. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of Miracle Voices. This is Matthew McCabe, and I am here with my co-host, Tam Morgan. Tam, how are you doing today? Doing well. Really look forward to today's podcast, and I am out here in California and excited to get into it. And I'm excited that we have Grace Avalon here, author of Thank God I'm Crazy. Grace, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I am delighted to be with you. This opportunity to share with you is, well, it's quite a full circle moment for me. And I'm looking forward to talking about that. Yeah, Grace, give the listeners a sense of geography. Where are you sitting today? Oh, I'm sitting in my home office in South Orange County, California, looking at a wonderful view of the Pacific Ocean and Catalina Island. And I'm feeling such um, gratitude. Uh, As I was just thinking, this actually feels right now as though I'm in my fourth lifetime, because when I talk about my past, as I'm willing to do, I can hardly relate to that person that I was decades ago. Go ahead. I, I, I just wanted to say that this opportunity to share my paranormal story with you, you who I understand is someone quite familiar with that world, as was your mother, is an opportunity to share my experience at the same time, talk about the wonderful guidance that I received from A Course in Miracles, because it's it's not every day that I find an audience that is open to both. And I especially appreciate it because for over three decades of my life, I didn't tell anyone about my secret life. And I do hope that others find a meaning in that. Well, I look forward to hearing about it even though I know a little bit about it uh, from what you sent (laughs) in. Um, Yeah, because I kept that part secret as well. Oh, yes. My mother did it for me, but (laughs) but I did in the rest of my life. Yeah, it's like living two lives, isn't it? It can be. It can be. (laughs) It it integrates really beautifully. I'm excited to hear about this. Uh, So... But Grace, before we go down that road, can you just give us a little background of how A Course in Miracles came into your life? Oh, yes. Actually, that's the big story. That's the one that um, brought, that brought um, that's the metaphysical story. It came into my life in 1986 when a friend uh, took me to hear Gloria and, and Ken Wapnick in San Diego. And uh, my friend knew that I would be blown away by what they would say, but he asked me to trust him. And I had no idea where I was going. Uh, and, but, and there's, there's quite a series of events over many years that left, led up to that moment. So I'm going to just touch upon that. Um, to understand why and how it all came about requires me first to share some of my background. When I was only 22, I had a life-changing experience that led me to a shift in my entire perspective of what reality is. But up until then, I'd had a difficult life, an abusive childhood. My father, who was a layman, Southern Baptist preacher, among other things, kept us girls walking really a thin line, beating us with his belt and telling us, how guilty and sinful we were. But the rest of the time, he didn't bother to give us the time of the day. And then my mother, who had emotionally shut down, was cold and indifferent to us girls and often mean. Um, And she was as, as afraid of daddy as we were. 
my parents were from the South, uh, from Tennessee, but we came to California when I was only two. And growing up, the only life that I had was outside the home. Somehow I managed to be popular in school and get good grades. There was just a stubborn determination about me. And I even fought back in arguments with daddy, which is what we called him, um, which of course just led to more beatings. But I never thought of myself as anything except just somebody who was living for the day that I could finally get out of my situation. I dreamed about going to college so I could become independent and be in uh, control of my life. But, well, I knew daddy would never make that happen. So actually, I think he wanted me out of the house as much as I, as much as I wanted to be out. So I tried to make it happen myself by going to junior college. But daddy made me pay rent. and I had to stay there and work part time. And it just became too much. So. I married the sailor that I'd been dating for four years, and we moved to the East Coast, finally settling in Frederick, Maryland. But it was in Fairmont, West Virginia, where we first lived on campus while my husband was attending college to become a teacher that I had my first life-changing experience. Just within a month after being married, I had been devastated to discover that my new husband had a dark side. He'd kept hidden for four years. He kept this side, um, I mean, I just had no clue. And he was abusive, but it was far worse. And I've heard you say this, Tam, uh, regarding someone in your family. He was physically abusive, but his emotional abuse nearly destroyed me and any sense of my own self-worth. And it was all I could do to try to just be a good mother to our baby girl and our toddler son. Well, this was now 1960, and I just turned 22. Then one morning at 4 a.m., I couldn't sleep, and I was sitting on the sofa. And as I did, often I crumbled in deep, sorrowful sobs. And that's when it happened. I suddenly left my body. It was, I was just looking up into the corner of the ceiling. I can remember it like it was yesterday. And I was sucked up, up like uh, going in through the next, a nexus or the lens of a camera. And I was swept away into the exquisite kaleidoscopic rays of light, you know, like in a kaleidoscope. And I was gleefully floating through nothing but just glorious and loving light. I was consumed in pure and simple bliss. And there was only good. There, there was nothing bad. And this being that I thought was grace completely lost its meaning. I was just a child in a wonderland of joy. So, of course, what did I do? I began to laugh and laugh and laugh. So for two days, I floated in between this perfect world of non-duality that made me laugh out loud. And then a world of duality that was the hell that was my life. Well, and I that's that in that hell I desperately sought for compassion or even just a modicum of love. My abusive husband's solution to my situation then, he decided to put me into West Virginia State Mental Hospital. And um, yes, it really was like the movie <laughs> One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And after nine days of being shot with drugs of who knows what. I was dragged back into the world of duality. I can remember on the drive home from the middle hospital, I remember looking around and seeing a world of so much pain and greed and betrayal and death. And it was clear to me that this, that it is this world that is crazy. It was my newfound world of only light and love that is sanity. But there, there's more to the story. Something else happened in my visions as I seemed to be floating along, like drifting on a stream of light. I was shown various images, nothing special, uh, just images like an ordinary curved driveway, 
uh, lined with evergreen trees, a road sign with the number 144 on it, and a peaceful moonlit hot tub by the ocean, and a sphinx-like mountain with a highway at the foot of it, where over all the lanes of the highway was a banner-like white sign that was completely blank. Well, this is important because over several decades, those images actually did manifest. I'm going to take a little sip of water here. This is a hard story to tell. They actually happened in my life. And I didn't realize it at first, but I, later I came to see that they were symbols that uh, spirit would use to get my attention to help me trust my inner guidance and the guidance I was being shown that would lead me to find love and inner peace. And then surprisingly, as time went by, I began to get direction through other symbols that were not what I'd seen in my visions. I'll explain, but there's a quote from the workbook of the course that has come to meet, mean so much to me and, and make sense out of my story. And that quote is, um, it's in uh, I, um, lesson 28, I think. We live by symbols. We have made up names for everything we see. You could in fact gain vision from just that table if you could withdraw all of your own ideas from it because it has something to show us that is beautiful and clean and full of happiness and hope and hidden under all of our ideas about it is its real purpose. So it's not the symbol that is important. It's the message that I keep in mind as I tell my story. So then something else happened about 10 years after my visions, uh, after um, they came in that kaleidoscopic light, it was something that I think helped me to be able to find meaning in those symbolic images. I had never told anyone about my visions, especially <laughs> about the mental hospital, because in those days, even the profession of psychiatry was under question. But my visions gave me a sense that somewhere out there, there might be a better world. And I had just begun to have a little more courage in life and myself. So I went back to college. And one day, as I was doing an assignment for an art class, when I put my brush to the canvas, something took control of it. And in 45 minutes, I had done a mono monochromatic painting of a light bulb, which was far beyond my ability. And it was exhausting. And when I later went back to look at it all, I was completely amazed because I realized that I could see my future in the images of the painting. Now, I can't explain how, and the future I saw wasn't good. It told me that everything I knew in my life at that time would all be taken from me. And indeed, in about 10 years, that did come to pass, which <clears throat> I won't go into right now, but the gift in that automatic painting was that now I knew for sure that there were truly, there just was truly more to this life. And somehow I also realized that this painting wasn't to scare me. It was to prepare me. So over the next decade, as our children grew up and this growing mystery uh, was inside of me, somehow I found the strength I'd never known, and I graduated with honors with a teaching degree, Pam, from Hood College, which was there in Frederick, Maryland. I just can't tell you how delighted I was to find that your mother had graduated from Hood College also. And um, I was actually in, in shock when I heard that. I, I just cried out loud. So I taught kindergarten for five years, and then I was certified to teach special education, so I did. And I was offered two administrative jobs. Well, my success made my husband very jealous, and things at home became even more unbearable. So I was still trying to make I was still trying to make the marriage work for the children's sake. I actually quit teaching and I went into real estate, but that didn't help because I was successful there too. 
And by then, emotionally, I was slipping into a dark and desperate place. Then one day by accident, I learned that my husband was having an affair with my best girlfriend. I, I was literally at the brink of an emotional collapse, and that's when the first symbol actually appeared. I was driving down her driveway, and suddenly it was like time stood still. Here was the curved driveway image that I'd seen in my visions with the sunlight streaming through the evergreen trees, just exactly as I'd seen it. I had actually helped her plant those trees when they were just seedlings, and it felt like an overwhelming sense of deja vu, except that miraculously, I did remember that moment when I had seen this image in my visions that I had long ago buried in the back of my mind. I leaned over the steering wheel sobbing, and I, and I remember I just felt such gratitude because in the midst of my despair, this memory gave me hope. In that moment, I had the clear sense that I was being guided. And not only that, but I knew somehow, for some reason, that this dark time was meant to be. When this image of the evergreen trees came back into my life, it, it gave me the, the courage to, well, to get into counseling at the risk of provoking severe violence from my husband. And I managed to leave my husband. The divorce was a bitter battle that went on for three years, and it was during that time that the second symbolic, symbolic image appeared. Late one night, when I was leaving my friend's home, I suddenly realized that my husband's car was following me because it was late. Then I knew, I knew that he would even have been heavily drinking, so I immediately feared for my life. I drove faster and he did too. And I'd never been so frightened, even during our marriage. Then suddenly I saw the highway road sign and it was in my visions with the number 144 on it. In a miraculous moment, I was able to completely surrender to the knowing that this was meant to be, that somehow Whatever was happening, this was my destiny, that I was being guided by some divine source or higher awareness. And it was in that miracle moment when I shifted out of fear, and then an idea just came to me. It was divine guidance that told me to drive right down the main street of town, where I knew the police would be watching for teenagers to come out of the bars since it was Saturday night, and it worked. After a while, he did disappear, and I made it back to my apartment. Well, eventually, I did get my divorce. It was a long, sordid story and took three years. But finally, I could feel what empowerment was like. My courage had come from that wonderful, tiny voice within that was just, it was not of me. So I started packing because I wanted to return to my family in Southern California. And in a very cruel way, my husband has tur had turned his family against me. So I longed to see them. And by then, my son was in the Air Force and my daughter had married during our separation. Daddy had passed on, but Mama was still here in California with my two sisters who had four children between them. And I was just so hungry for their love and hoping that time had matured us all, including my mother, now that daddy was gone. So I had forgotten about the other visions, but unknown to me, they remained in the back of my mind. <laughs> well, that is until I discovered Dana Point here on the coast in Southern California. Suddenly then my life seemed like, <laughs> it seemed like I was on acid because now I'd started to have visions in the middle of the day and they were dramatic. I won't go into it all now, so I'll just mention a few points. The first one happened soon after I arrived when I was out on a Sunday drive along the coast and I found myself entering Dana Point. Just, and just as I looked to the hillside on my left, 
I heard a strange voice in the car say, where are the houses? Well, there was no one else in the car. And I realized that I had said that out loud. I had no idea what was happening, but now I seemed to be in a sort of higher awareness. And before I knew it, my newly purchased Volvo was turning into a Century 21 real estate office. And I heard myself asking uh, about local real estate. And after qualifying me, the realtor kindly informed me I couldn't afford anything. But then she remembered an owner who had really bad luck um, prior with his condo. And she thought since I'd been a teacher, he might feel he could trust me. Well, he offered me his condo at, at half the usual rent. And I walked in. It was a tiny little place with only two windows, but I knew that I was home. And I lived there for four years. And those years turned out to be the most profound turning point in my life. Here I was <laughs> in the 80s, attractive four-year-old woman, ready to party, but spirit had something else in mind. Most of the time, when I wasn't working in my condo, journaling or reading about the metaphysical, or down at the harbor, where the first time I had driven there, I was overcome with deep guttural uh, just sobs, because as I later learned, I was sensing a past life there where I had been an Indian maiden who eventually was drawn and quartered by the tribe and left on a hilltop on a suspended rawhide bed. And here I didn't even, you know, I, I saw this, but yet at that time, I didn't even believe in past lives. And my father would have said it was the work of the devil. So from then on, it just seemed to me like my subconscious was just, dumping everything. Somehow I felt like I knew that I was safe and it was okay, um, and no matter what it was. And, and so it did. For example, um, I got so that I couldn't concentrate on my job at Merrill Lynch because I was having a really frightening, recurring dream about drowning under green black water. So I took the advice of my instructor at Chapman College where I was studying part-time in psychology, and I found a hypnotist. I went to see him, again, in spite of my childhood, fundamentalist doctrine that led me to think that I might burn in hell. <laughs> in that um, session, the, the, of the, I found myself remembering a past life in Atlantis, and I hadn't even heard of Atlantis. I saw myself as one of nine priestesses who intentionally magnified people's higher thoughts with sound and crystal. But eventually civilization fell into de degenerative ways. So I became enraged and misused my power and many people died. And of course we all died in the end, but the unconscious guilt about that had come to me in a symbolic dream because it had remained in my psychic memory in this lifetime. And in order to let it go, this symbolic dream brought it back. I realized that. And when I finally forgave myself and was able to love that part of me, there was a shift. My inner, inner turmoil just vanished. And it was then that I learned the value of letting go of my past. So I'm, I'm still answering your question. Um, during my four years in my little condo, more than ever, my life was seeming like one mysterious dream that I was actually living out. There were other symbols, too, as I said, that were not on my visions, and they became road signs, letting me know that change was coming. It wasn't always easy, but if I chose it, it was always good. Um, like a painting I, that I was obsessed to buy, or when I knew with that, quote, knowing um, when I saw the number 54 on my condo door, that that would be the age when I would remarry. And it was. And I married someone who had been in my Atlanta's pot lifetime. And it was him who took me to that hot tub by the ocean that I'd seen in my first visions. It was at that time also when the houses that I'd seen when first coming to Dana Point were actually built. They actually did 
happen. <laughs> so this was not like I was psychic. It felt like profound messages from spirit, spirit who was using these symbols, the symbols of the world to guide me. But I wasn't ready. I, I, actually, I wasn't really sure where or why. And to my great surprise, my life was becoming easier by letting go of past fear and guilt that I was unconsciously carrying. And I began to have more light in my eyes, a bounce in my step. I laughed more and I even thought I looked younger. <laughs> so to answer your question, how did A Course in Miracles come into my life? It was in 1984 when I had come to Dana Point and it was 1986 um, when I was dating a sort of spiritual friend and I finally broke down and told him a little bit of my story. Um, not, was, not, not what was happening the, to me and Dana Point though, because I thought he'd run away screaming. But then one weekend he asked me to let me, let him surprise me and he spent the day with him in San Diego. And it was on that day, my friend took me to hear one of Ken and Gloria's early workshops. And I'll never forget how not far into Ken's talk, I remember, I remember a ringing sound in my ears. And it was like I was floating up over the congregation. And can you imagine my overwhelm when I heard him say that life is a dream, an insane dream, no less, and that everything in the dream is a symbol to guide us home? Well, that's when I immediately bought a copy of A Course in Miracles. When I got home, I nestled it in my backpack like it was a precious stone. And for seven months, in every spare moment, I'd sneak down to my little cove that I'd found by the ocean and read and cry with pure gratitude until the tide drove me home. And then I'd read in bed till I fell asleep because after all, here it was, my certificate to sanity, I called it. Life is a crazy dream. Not only that, the course clarified my purpose, which is that the way to find love is by forgiving. And I had already begun to do as, you know, I had already begun to do. And, but even better, the course doesn't stop there. It gave, and every day gives me specific lessons as how to do that. And I'm now on my third copy of the course because the first two just fell apart. <laughs> so that's how I came, the, the course came into my life. Wow. <laughs> what? Lots of, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of forgiveness opportunities. Yeah. Oh, yes. oh I, my gosh. Like I, I just relived it and I didn't know how emotional it was for me to go through all of that. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to share it. Yeah. The course mentions that, you know, it's normal you know, to start to access part of your minds that you didn't think was available before. And then it, and then it becomes available and, you know, it's not, it's just normal. It's just that it's not normal for us walking around the world, most of us. So oh, it's good to yeah. hear that level of detail. Oh yeah. So and, I'm sorry. It also, um, it also is a, very much what Helen went through. Um, in in that world of as she entered um some paranormal territory um really i mean literally she called bill in the middle of the night and said i'm going crazy i'm going crazy <laughs> and he said why and she said i you know after our conversation about finding a better way i'm hearing this voice that's telling me you know, this is a course in miracles. Take notes, and and thank God for his response. She didn't wake her husband, by the way. She woke Bill, and he said, "Go ahead and do it, and I'll I'll look at it in the morning, and let's see." And there and here we are. <laughs> Tam, I am so glad you mentioned that because the first thing I did uh, I, when I bought the course at that uh, some at that workshop with Ken, I also bought a journey without distance. And I just bawled. I mean, I bawled through that whole book. And I remember her story about having a dream about a cave 
mm-hmm. uh, you know, where she saw the, the scrolls. And then I believe it was Ken who um, uh, we arranged a trip and they went to Israel and she went and she saw that cave. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I thought, yeah. oh, <laughs> it's funny <laughs> that you, crazy. <laughs> well, I think we're all crazy. So it's both. Um, but, but yes, it's, it's when, you know, where we let these stories take us and it shows very, you know, sometimes we can go crazy when we get too much information and we get into an alter world, um, where it, 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 we become flooded and it really looks like, you know, you have kept the information in a place where you could follow it through spirit and not through the mind uh, nearly as much. And I think that that's where, that's where the line is. Oh, I like that definition. Yes. I just, suddenly felt like there was a power as that you know as we say that is in me but not of me and i i i hung on to it it was my life uh saver <laughs> yeah but it is an extraordinary experience to see certain things and then have them appear again you know, I, yeah. I know from from my own uh childhood having dreams where you know, I knew something was going to happen and it was always a bad something. It was never like a wonderful, good something. Um, And, and, you know, really insisting that it was going to happen. And my mother saying, it's just a dream. It's like, no, it's about to happen. And watching it unfold until that moment of really going inside and saying, what is this for? And do I want this? What do I need this? And, when I, I heard at times it was for preparation for something of how to be during a difficult experience, it shifted me tremendously. Um, okay, what is this for? Why do we need to see signs for the future? Why, why you know, our path truly, according to the Course, is to stay in the present. And we can very much get into the world of story if we completely let that take over and the magic of it, but it's also extraordinary. You know, it's all at once. Yes, and, and, and you know, that's a very good point. It, it really does make you stand at a, at a decision point. You know, what, what, what is this for? And, and then it puts the choice in my, my pl- I'm the one that has to make the choice. And I, I felt that early on, but I didn't know why I was making. I, I just knew something great was trying to help me. <laughs> yeah. And I, th- you know, I think that again, that's a, that's an amazing place to be. And that's the gift of grace, uh, mm-hmm. pun intended, uh, <laughs> you know, that, that you got to follow that line and bring it into your sanity when other people were accusing you of being insane and you were, you know, walking a line of, where is my truth? Because in this dream level, there are people who go off the edge with, yeah. with visions and things that they're hearing. And, and where does it balance with an illusion that we seem to be sharing together as well? Mm-hmm. And, you know, talking with uh, people who are, are, you know, can be in a schizophrenic world where it's, it's different it actually is different, but it intersects with the yeah. truth that we're talking about. Like you start to hear voices and, oh my God, I, am I insane? How do I keep the secret? If I share it, where will that bring me? Um, and then what is an alignment with truth versus, you know, perhaps even a chemical disorder? Uh, right. And it is, it is continuously the lessons in the course that give us that anchor to um to start to know the difference and to see the gifts of it 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 just feels so good to talk to you because it you know it's that sense that what you said is you you're walking a thin line and yet i really learned how to be an outgoing kind of person in the daytime or or in you know whatever duties i had as a teacher or, or in business and 
and then to go home and be in my in that this story that was ongoing. Yeah, yeah. It 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 becomes uh, a double life. Look, Bill uh, led a double life. Helen led a double oh. life. You know, <laughs> and there is there can be that path. You know where sight is can be threatening yeah. to to other people because it is a different it's a different gift <laughs> than people are used to and i think i think there's so much more openness to it now in in our culture oh, thank um you. and uh, yeah certainly from when i was growing up where if you talked about the word psychic which i still to this day cringe when i hear that word intuitive somehow i can handle better but you know it was immediate thoughts um all my friends of a brian de palma movie you know of where you give someone else a cerebral brain hemorrhage if you have psychic abilities and it's it's so negative um to to being a seer and seers have been honored throughout history it's just in more our recent past where it became work of the devil and uh yes. you know all of that so where it brings in to keep to keep turning it over keep turning it over and even not be attached to the it's still story yeah it's, it's still the world of story so it's an amazing thing and when we can see something and then it starts to come true but it's still story <laughs> and what the course teaches us is to even let go of that, even let go of that and go continue. Are we feeling love right now? What is really important? Are we extending love? Are we feeling love? Mm -hmm. And that it's brought you to that is, oh, yeah. is the wonderful definitely has. Um, aspect of all this and that you continue that dedication. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you. Thank you. Grace, mm. I'm I'm really interested in what happened with your husband that was following you through town in the car and then everything is is he your 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 healing story that you're going to share? Uh, ironically, no. It was my father that was my greatest forgiveness lesson. I forgave him first, and then it was easy to forgive my husband because um, I I had gotten I got. I got it <laughs> about yeah. forgiveness, but my, my forgiveness, uh, there was one specific challenge with my father that was without a doubt, the hardest forgiveness lesson of my life. And um, if I may, I also had a really beautiful aha forgiveness moment uh, for myself that I'd like to share along with this little bit um, sure. about my father. Okay. Well, first off, it's it's relevant to say that after finding A Course in Miracles, I, I say I cut my teeth on learning about what true forgiveness is, not making it real. And um, in my relationship with one of my sisters, because growing up, our mother had created a really dysfunctional relationship between us by always comparing my sister's failures with my success in school and with friends. And she would say, why can't you be like Grace? Well, my sister was an introvert. And as might be expected, she became very jealous of me. And of course, she had low self esteem. So when I returned to California, she had made a life of her own and really didn't want me there. As a reminder of her inferiorities in the past. And without any reason, she would attack me and even go into tirades in front of others and uh, about anything and everything I'd done. This actually went on for about 10 years as I persisted in making myself return to the lessons of the course and the hard part, of course, remembering to actually do them during emotionally heated situations. And I even went so far as to write the core message of my daily workbook lessons on a sticky note and I carried it around with me all, all the day, always reminding myself that I could see peace instead of this. And uh, remembering that to teach is to demonstrate. Oh, those were two hard lessons. But eventually I was able to show love most of the time or 
just not get involved or walk away if that's what was needed. And at last she did finally begin to feel my love um, as she seemed to have gotten her anger out of her system. But it wasn't without a lot of drama and embarrassing times. But I'm just so grateful to say that I now count my sister as one of my greatest opportunities to learn about seeing only love. And today she's one of my very best friends. But by far the hardest lesson in forgiveness that I had was with my father. So I had to go under hypnosis once again in order to face a mental block that I that had prevented me from just remembering a hideous childhood abuse by my father. Just like the inner turmoil I'd felt before, um, my hypnosis set, that session that I had regarding Atlantis, I became really deeply disturbed and I didn't know why. This time my disturbance was so deep that I had to find help from healers uh, to prepare me to face whatever it was that I didn't know I didn't know. And um, one of them surrounded me with crystals and urged me to scream as loud as I could. And the second one was an artist, a well-known artist, and she used images to help provoke any uh, deeply buried feelings until finally I was just ready to get it over with. And under hypnosis, I relived a horrible time when I was just a toddler. I won't go into it here now, but you... You can read about it in my book. My father had committed what could be seen as an unforgivable sin, and I developed a complete mental block to keep me from remembering it. I had totally suppressed this memory and similar abuse throughout my childhood, and these suppressed memories were lurking in my subconscious, pulling me down and preventing me from being in the joy of my true self. And as the Course says, miracles are my right, but (laughs) purification is necessary first. So for about six months, I harbored pure hate towards him. I got involved, um, at least I got involved in an incest therapy group, and I would go down into the harbor and sit in my car by the water and scream and cry and swear at my dead father. And it felt like I had lost my dignity and my identity. And then finally, when I couldn't cry anymore, one night when I was sitting in my car by the water, I remember looking up to that beautiful starry night and it just seemed to come to me. My father was no longer a body. He had played his part in my lifetime drama for whatever reason. And what's more, I had chosen it. As the Course says, everything that happens to you, you've asked for, and it happens exactly as as you've asked. And it also says, beware of the temptation to consider yourself unfairly treated. So whenever I attack another body in the dream, I realize that that this is my dream. There is no one else out there. There is a workbook lesson that says, And this was really helpful to me. It can be but myself I crucify whenever I don't forgive. Forgiveness is the key to happiness. I realized that all of us, all of the characters in my dream are really all one. We're all just love. We are all love just looking for itself. And that included my father. It was then that I was finally able to bless him out loud. And I actually had come to a place where I could thank him for our lessons together. It was a magnificent moment for me because I was finally able to let it all go. And I was in peace about it all from then on. The biggest forgiveness for me in that lesson was that 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 was when I really got it, that we are all one. Uh, But strange as it might seem, even with all that had happened, I hadn't yet been able to put it all together, that everything in the dream is already over. And we're just remembering, you'd think I would, but this was shown to me when the last symbol in my kaleidoscopic visions made itself known. And it brought me to an awesome awareness of what the forgiveness process in this dream is all about. 
And it's not just about forgiveness for this being that I think of as grace. When the last vision appeared, which was that sphinx-like mountain that I mentioned with the highway below it and a blank sign over it, I was driving north one afternoon from San Diego, which um, this was a different direction than my daily drive because I worked in Newport. And that's when I saw it <laughs> right there in front of me, sitting right beside the freeway, right at my own freeway exit was my visionary mountain. I'd been looking at the opposite side of that same mountain as I was driving to and from work every day. In my vision, I'd seen the backside of my own exit, which of course was blank. And then I realized that I had actually been living at the foot of that mountain for four years, all while purging my past and learning about true forgiveness and unconditional love. But I had I'd just been too close to see it, to it, to see it. I'm leaving a lot out, but later I learn lesson that my mountain held for me. I managed to go up on that mountain in 1994. And I was standing there looking out over the, mount, over the ocean. And it was then when it really hit me. Here I am standing in my own vision that I had seen in 1960. Decades earlier, this mountain had marked the place where I would live during an amazing, amazing years of personal transition. And it was then that I got it, that this dream is already over. I had actually, I remembered then that I'd heard Ken Wapnick say earlier, we are safe at home with God dreaming of exile, but perfectly capable of awakening to reality. But for some reason at that time, I just couldn't take it all in. So as I stood there on my mountain, I had a vision which showed me how innocent that we all really are. It was an image of myself standing on that mountain when the word of God, um, I, I just saw the word of God being spoken from another mountain far away. But then there's a brief delay because the word is carried in the echo until it reaches me. And it's in the echo, that precise moment between the expression of God's word and my hearing it and understanding it, that is the dream of time. Yet, actually, it is only a millisecond of eternity, while God's child, which is me, takes in the reality of my own grand creation, and in the echo, time was born so that the world could be heard and digested by the heart and mind of the Son of God. So, where's the guilt in that? The Course says that I'm seeing the journey, looking back from the point at which it has already ended, yet imagining I'm making it once again, just like when we're, uh, we think we are seeing a beautiful star. We know it's already burned out and its process is over, but we can still enjoy it. So it was then I got it in a big way. There, there's no reason to feel any guilt. The dream is an echo. The dream's only purpose is to remember the love of God that we truly are. I remember feeling so innocent, I wanted to dance. And I, like a kid up there on the mountain, I was back in my kaleidoscopic light on a boat floating through time. And like in, in the kaleidoscopic light, I saw myself and everyone as if we are all diamonds in the rough. And it's by the loving and forgiving our relationships. It was with each other, that we are sanding away everything that hides the beautiful rays of light that we truly are, the diamonds that we are. Relationships are our school. They are our way home. Each one is a holy encounter and an opportunity to grow. And the Course says, in him, you will find yourself or lose yourself. So after all, this whole dream is just a tiny idea. <laughs> And a mad one at that. <laughs> Ken said, the ego is not real. It's our belief in the ego that makes it seem real. So I realized that as long as I feel guilt, I can't accept what God wants to show me. This was truly a visceral moment for me, which helped me to get in touch with the un 
conscious guilt. And that's um, what Judy helped me with when she came eight days after she, uh, I'm going to say, ascended. <laughs> and that unconscious guilt is in everyone's subconscious mind. So my mountain experience opened a process of forgiving myself for my faults and imperfections. And it helped me to get in touch with my true innocent self at a much higher level on the ladder. Um, our collective dream of time is just, well, it's just a learning device, as the Course says, that teaches that we are not what we thought we were. I'm just here using time to take in the actual grandeur that I am. That was what I could understand there on the mountain. And hopefully learning to have a good time while I'm at it. <laughs> and, and by the way, I'll just mention that um, I later found out that that mountain had been in a burial ground. And I knew that it was on that mountain that I'd been taken to die in a past life uh, when I was an Indian maiden. So the Course has given me what I've needed to lift me above the battleground. As it says... Uh, so I've I read so many times, and I think of lifting myself above the battleground, like you said, uh, Tam, that that's how we have to, I have to, you know, come out, get lift myself out of it. And so I could understand my paranormal experiences, but it showed me how to learn from them. This opportunity today to share with you at the Foundation for a Course in Miracles and I'm going to cry. No, I'm not going to cry. <laughs> it's truly a full circle moment. Not only did the course make me feel like I was being a, given a certificate to sanity. Um, well, the course helped me to find the courage to, I say, quote, come out, and also to write the book that I've written, which I've called, Thank God I'm Crazy. And I was inspired to write it, for, uh, to share my prophetic experiences that have taught me when we can see the insanity of our lives, then it opens the door for us to see the sanity of the love that we all really are. So um, I, I can only just, you know, I've covered the highlights today, but I put my story about the miracles that happened to me in novel form. And I'm happy to say it's on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. And um, just want to let you know that the pic there are pictures in the book of the images from my visions that I've talked about that actually did happen. And I've um, one chapter in the book is focused and dedicated to the principles of A Course in Miracles. And I'm honored to say that Thank God I'm Crazy is endorsed by Marianne Williamson and Beverly Hutchinson, my good friend of Miracle Distribution Center. And the foreword was written by Gary Renard, whom I'm truly blessed to have as a friend and Cindy his wife as well. And I've had the joy of teaching A Course in Miracles for nine years in Mission Viejo. And I took my classes on the 45 minute drive. I just, I cherish those days to Temecula many times to hear Ken talk. And I went there of course myself. And I'll always remember how childishly happy and loving he was. Ken read the first part of my book <laughs> before he passed, and then he snail mailed me a little wonderful note of encouragement that I, I will always cherish. And I've dedicated a page to Ken on my website, uh, which is graceavalon.com, along with a link and an information um, and information about A Course in Miracles. And you can go directly to A Course in Miracles from my website. And I might also mention that I publish a monthly newsletter where I try to write with humor about the teachings of A Course in Miracles, and I call it See Only Love. And um, in fact, last November's issue was dedicated completely to Judy Scotch. Um, you know, Pam, Judy and I never met, but we exchanged a couple of emails just prior to her transition, and I'd listened to every one of her interviews on this program. And I don't, you know, I really can't explain it, but I had a deep emotional connection with her. And I was very weepy after her transition. And as I said, she came to me following and she actually came to me while I was under anesthetic and um, for, for a, a, just a small procedure. But 
Judy became my inspiration to let go of serious unconscious guilt that I'd been carrying for a long time. And I allowed it was allowing it to prevent me from moving on with several projects that I'm now ready to do and excited to do. And I have the Course in Miracles and all of you to thank for that. Oh, that's so uh, really, really meaningful. And what greater compliment to have someone be that symbol to come into your life that my mother would love to know that she was still being brought in that way to to open up and have people feel loving. Thank you for <laughs> thank you for that part. Oh yes. Yeah. Um, I loved it when I discovered that she and I had graduated from it was a women's college. Yes. Oh yes. Amazing. Uh -huh. Amazing. And, and it kind of it was always obscure to me in that. Yeah. Um, I will say, since this is my my year committed to keeping to trying to um, bring in more clarity and less confusion about what we do at the Foundation for Inner Peace, um, along with every other organization who is part or connected to A Course of Miracles, is that um, there was a moment that you connected me with FASM. And you know, we'll always be connected through uh, through sisterly. We called it sisterly for some reason um, uh, association with Ken's organization, but the organization that I'm with is Foundation for Inner Peace. Oh yeah. Um, and 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 there's so much confusion in the marketplace. So I just wanted to iterate that if people misunderstood that. Right, right. Yeah, there's ACIM and then F. Yeah. What is it? F F I P is what yes. FIP, right? But which always makes me laugh. It's really not the best little an acronym there, but um <laughs> sometimes it sounds like FIB online. Um but yeah, Foundation for Inner Peace being a different a separate organization unto itself that yes. that publishes of course in miracles. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And you're up in Marin, are you not? Yes. Yes. Uh, I, you know, the, the coincidence about Hood College uh, in Frederick, Maryland, um, but Judy and myself graduating from that college, that's the town where all those uh, visions happen and, mm. and, I mean, and manifested for me. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Grace, one of the things that a lot of people struggle with, including myself and people that write into um, the website and ask questions is the the seeing someone as having wronged you um, or you having had wronged them and then that kind of switch where you see it as not real and not something you have to you not something you have to forgive in the way of the world but something you have to see as not real how how do you offer encouragement to people that are having struggles and they say damn this feels real like there's no way I can see this is not real because there's emotion. I have this cluster of thoughts and anger around it. And um, it, it appears like in every way it's real and duality. And I can't seem to transcend or see this differently despite, you know, praying and wanting to. Do you have any words of encouragement there? Oh, my. Yes. In fact, I love what I've heard you call it an ego storm. <laughs> where, um, of course, you know, practicing the lessons and and um, uh, getting a, as internal as possible is the it's all a process. But as I've said, what I've learned is that miracles are everyone's right, but and <laughs> purification is necessary first. And after facing my fears and guilt of the past that brought me to know my innocence. My daily challenge has become to live with the practice of true forgiveness. And the more I do it, I know that there is calm and peace. And, and that's what can happen. Um, we feel a, a modicum of peace or a level of peace. And then the more we do it, that peace deepens and becomes more the norm of, your, of my day. So I always begin. Uh, actually, there's kind of two little points I'd like to make. I always begin the day asking Holy Spirit to take charge of my mind. But whenever peace 
my peace was disturbed. I found um, two options to help me let go of wrong thinking and guide me back to joy that love always brings. And the Course also says that the body is a beautiful lesson in communion. So I remember that. It's a beautiful lesson in communion until communion is. And when I listen to my body and my feelings, they can tell me when I've wandered away from remembering the truth. So whenever I'm feeling out of alignment or a little depressed, I, I, I've i kind of come up with this personal little um, code, I guess you could say. I, I use the firefighter's advice for anyone who is on fire, <laughs> and that is to stop drop and roll. And the first step is whenever I'm feeling on fire with anger or judging others, and even myself, my feelings are my fire alarm that alert me that I've wandered into the wrong place. And that's when I know I need to stop and realize that this is wrong thinking and it's disturbing my peace. Now, this is the hardest part and it's the most important part. And it becomes easier the more that we do it. But then step two, I know it's time to take a quick look at what I've been thinking and just make the decision to drop it. Just drop my chaotic thinking and know that's what it is. It's an ego storm that is placing a veil over the light in me. And then finally, and usually I do this with a deep breath, I imagine myself rolling into the always present love of the Holy Spirit. And then I know it's time to choose once again and re-invite him to take charge of my mind. So after that, I know I need to do nothing because forgiveness is my only function. I don't have to worry about a specific outcome because I know that spirit is guiding me. And then my second foolproof way to get out of the grasp of an ego storm is to always remember to laugh. I've I've always said, and I know Judy, I just loved her laugh. And I loved um, that, that she always came back around to that. I've always said that there is no accident that my reaction to my kaleidoscopic light was to laugh. Because laughter, laughter is sanity. The Course assures us that we are in, when we are in joy, we are in truth. For nine days, I'm sorry, nine years, <laughs> at the beginning of each A Course in Miracles class that I taught, I always started with a joke, that I and I called it harmless humor. As people would come into the room, of course, carrying the cares of the days on their mind, and when I read the joke before going into um, a brief meditation, as we laughed together, our laughter bonded us and brought us into the room, and the cares of the day were then gone. So then in our oneness, we were ready to join our minds with the Holy Spirit. And I'm I'm now writing a second book with the emphasis on the sanity of laughing at ourselves. And Tam, I believe I I heard you say on this program that when we are laughing, uh, we can't be in fear. Because laughter is the glorious sound of a soul waking up. (laughs) That's it. You know, when like I've been hearing, for, you know, when something comes up and then suddenly you see it and hear it everywhere. So the stop, drop and, and roll um, mm-hmm. has been coming up with so many people and, and using that expression. And, and my interpretation of it is actually stop, drop and droll, like D-R-O-L-E, uh, because that that laughter that gets put in at that moment um, saves me all the time. That's, that's what I do. That's a good one. Oh, I love that. I love that. I may, I may borrow that. Take it. Don't uh, share it. <laughs> Just share it. <laughs> yeah. Well, Grace, well, this I, is, this has been so lovely having you on the show and hearing about your forgiveness opportunities and everything you have gone on. You have quite, you know, you ever heard that term, the Overton window is the uh, the window of allowable discourse. You know, we can talk about sports and weather kind of at the center there, but as we get to paranormal stuff, you know, there's a lot of people that are saying, oh my gosh, do I want to hear this? It's making me uncomfortable. But I think most of our listeners do want to hear this. This is, this really scratches an itch because we're so curious, like how can we do more? How can we go deeper? 
and hearing your story really, you know, it did that for us. So thank you. Oh, I'm so glad you said that because I do feel that way. And when I give talks and people will come up to me and they'll, they'll tell me things they've never told anyone else because I think because I've shared, they feel safe uh, to share. And uh, it's been such a joy to be able to share today because um, this course in miracles has introduced the meaning of salvation into my stormy metaphysical awakening. And it can do that for others. I, I, I know the beauty of having it as a companion and being there, you know, let spirit guide you, just open the book. I do this all the time, just open the book. And that's what I need, need to hear. And uh, as I said, you know, in my personal life, I can share my experience of, of abuse. And with some people, I can share my paranormal story. Not a lot. <laughs> and with others, I can share A Course in Miracles. But today, and that's why this is so meaningful, I've been able to share it all. And I deeply hope that there are those who uh, can find some comfort in my experience. Because together, we're helping each other to rise up and just see that big picture. And I, if I just might say, I always like to close my newsletter uh, uh, because I, I, I've learned to feel comfortable with the fact that I am crazy. We're all crazy. And uh, so I close my newsletter by saying, when you find yourself staring into the headlights of fear, I hope you can stop, allow yourself to laugh at your temporary insanity and say, as I often do, Thank God I'm crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was my point in, in titling my book that uh, other people said, why don't you, why don't you call it? Thank God I'm not crazy. <laughs> the point is I am. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, Tam, any closing comments or questions? Um, no, actually, I mean, we've covered so much here and, and Grace, you've covered so much uh, with all of this. Thank you for gathering all your thoughts that way um, that made it just a beautiful, clear storyline. And I do think this share is important. We all come at it from so many different angles. And when we insist on what is sane or not sane, there is the beginning of it insanity <laughs> and the course even tells us that the moment we believe we're right about something <laughs> there is the beginning of insanity i know i think i remember didn't mark twain say show me an insane man and i will cure him <laughs> or maybe that was um, carl young uh, we're all one someone said it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Grace, yes. I will link to your book in the show notes. Thank God I'm Crazy by Grace Avalon. Your website's graceavalon.com. Again, all that'll be in the show notes. Thanks so much for coming on and sharing your miracle voice. And we hope to chat with you again soon. Thank you so much. It's yeah. been a delight. And congratulations on the integration of all parts of you right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks so much for listening today. Please subscribe to Miracle Voices by hitting the subscribe button on your podcast app. If you are enjoying these conversations, please consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever podcast app you use. And lastly, please visit us at miraclevoices.org and join our newsletter so we can stay connected. Until the next podcast, I want to leave you with my favorite course quote, when you want only love, you will see nothing else. Nothing else.